Deuteronomy chapter 3 and beginning at verse 12. Well, when we took possession of the land, I assigned to the tribes of Reuben and Gad the territory north of the town of Aroah, near the river Arnon, which was part of the hill country of Gilead, along with its towns. To the half tribe of Manasseh, I assigned the rest of Gilead, and also all of Bashan, where Ark had ruled, that is, the entire Argot region. Bashan was known as the land of the Rephaim. Jair from the tribe of Manasseh took the entire region of Argon, that is Bashan, as far as the border of Geshur and Mark. He named the villages after himself, and they are still known as the villages of Jair. I assigned Gilead to the clan of Machir of the tribe of Manasseh. And to the tribes of Reuben and Gad, I assigned the middle of the river, uh, sorry, I assigned the territory from Gilead to the river Arnon. The middle of the river was their southern boundary, and their northern boundary, the river Jack, part of which formed the Anaheim border. On the west, their territory extended to the river Jordan, from Mount Galilee in the north, down to the Dead Sea in the south, and to the foot of Mount Pisgah on the east. At the same time, I gave them the following instructions. The Lord our God has given you this land, east of the Jordan, to occupy. Now arm yourselves, arm your fighting men, and send them across the Jordan ahead of the other tribes of Israel to help them to occupy their land. Only your wives, children, and livestock, I know you have a lot of livestock, will remain behind in the towns that I have assigned to you. Help your fellow Israelites until they occupy the land that the Lord is giving them west of the Jordan, and until the Lord lets them live there in peace, as has he already done here for you. After that, you may return to this land which I have assigned to you. <coughs> then I instructed Joshua, you have seen all that the Lord your God did to those two kings, Sion and Ark. And he will do the same to everyone else whose land you remain. Don't be afraid of them, for the Lord your God will fight for you. At that time I earnestly prayed, Sovereign Lord, I know that you have shown me only the beginning of the great and wonderful things you are going to do. There is no God in heaven or on earth who can do the mighty things that you have done. Let me cross the river Jordan along and see the fertile land on the other side, the beautiful hill country and the Lebanon mountains. Because of you people, the Lord was angry with me and would not listen. He said, he said, that's enough. Don't mention this again. Go to the peak of Mount Pisgah. Look to the north and to the south, to the east and to the west. Look carefully at what you see. Because you will never go across the Jordan. Give Joshua his instructions. Strengthen his determination. Because he will lead the people across to occupy the land that you see. So he remained in the valley opposite the town of Beth Peor. You will see, as I can, that uh, in the Good News Bible, and maybe uh, if you have the New International Version as well, there, there are headings that are inserted. They're not part of the text, but they seem to give us some idea of the content of what is to follow. And the second part of our reading has the heading, Moses forbidden to cross the Jordan. And I'm looking at that and I'm thinking, what? How on earth have we chosen that to be the heading for that passage? Okay, I mean, I know those are the verses in which the Lord says to Moses, he will not cross the Jordan. But my problem is this. The focus is on Moses. On what's going on in his life. And when you take verse 23, surely that is the very heart of this section. That is all about God. And I'm 
convinced that the purpose of the book of Deuteronomy is to point the people again and again and again and again to the Lord their God. That they might realize and understand who He is. That they might know and remember what He is like. That they may be convinced of what He can do. That they may be sure of the promises that He has given to them. In other words, the focus is upon the Lord. And so we're going to focus on that verse 23. In which Moses pleads with the Lord and says, O Sovereign Lord. Two Hebrew words here, Adonai and Yahweh. A little bit confusing because the word Adonai is often translated as Master or Lord. But in our Bibles, when we find the word Lord in small capital letters, that's the word Yahweh. Just to confuse us. However, if you read, I don't know that many of us do, uh, the preface and introduction to uh, particularly the New International Version, it says when those two words, Adonai and Yahweh, come together, they will always translate it and say, Sovereign Lord. I prefer to say, Lord Yahweh. The first word, Adonai, is a word that means to rule. To be sovereign over, and so to control. As a noun, it speaks of someone who is a master or a lord. Or if they're a ruler of a nation, then a king or a queen. Now a master may own or control a few servants. May treat them well or maybe not so well. A king may rule over less or more people. And they're often called his servants. Because they are subject to him. They are under his authority and his rule. And so this word Adam speaks of both sovereignty and protection. Sovereignty that the Lord reigns. Have you noticed how often the scriptures present to us this great description of God as king, as ruler? As seated upon a throne. It's there again and again and again. It's there in the beginning of uh, that wonderful book of Ezekiel. And he has that incredible vision of uh, lightning and fire and cloud. And, and then he sees these four creatures uh, that are holding some platform. And he sees wheels and wheels inside wheels and they're spinning and turning. And it's, you think, who on earth could ever try and draw a picture of? what that might look like. It'd be interesting to see what they ever came up with. But actually, it's not the important thing. The important thing is that for all the amazing description of that, on that platform there is a throne. And on that throne there is someone described in terms of glory, of blazing fire. And those images of fire and cloud and then of a rainbow. Images of the presence and the faithfulness of God. But God brought and set before us as one who is sovereign. Because providence is typically the statement that He provides. And that He orders all things. Now that may raise some questions for us when we see evil and chaos within the world. Take a whole series of sermons to address that whole topic. But we know that God owns us. God works out all things to conform with his purpose. And this is the one to whom Moses appeals. This is the one to whom Moses prays. And as he speaks to the people, this is the one in whose name he speaks. Sovereign Lord. And the word Lord there is the name of God. And in Bible days, a name was often important. Or we sometimes uh, choose a name because we just like the sound of it. Or maybe there's a footballer or a musician who has that name. Or perhaps a name's been in our family for generations and we're expected to include it. But sometimes we choose names for their meaning. I love the way some of the 
the Caribbean uh, ladies particularly carry names like mercy and blessing and hope and faith. I think they're just wonderful names and can be descriptive of, of, of their life and, and, and their personality. And so it is when Moses says to God, well, what is your name? God answers and says, I am. God answers and says, the Lord is my name. And so we have in uh, our English Bibles that word Lord printed in capitals. Probably pronounced Yahweh or something like that. The name of God. And as you look at that name in the context of Exodus 3 and Exodus chapter 6, that name describes the living God. He's alive. He is the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. It tells us that he is the God of promise. Because the very mention of the names of those three men says that everything that God is about to do with Moses will fulfill those promises. It tells us that this name is the name of the God who rescues, the God who saves, just as we were singing earlier. And the God who wonderfully, I think it was on in his prayer, says, calls us into fellowship with himself, to know him. We may say, you are our God. And hear the Lord say, you are my people. So this is the one to whom these verses are addressed. Moses thoughts, his prayer, the one who is the sovereign Lord. And the first thing that uh, Moses recognizes as he prays is the greatness of the Lord. Let me read verse 23 to you again. I'll read it this time from the New International Version. O oh, Sovereign Lord, you have begun to show to your servant your greatness. That's where Moses begins in his prayer. With the greatness of the Lord. And in fact, Moses will come back to that several times through this book of Deuteronomy. And when he gets to the very end of it, in chapter 32, he bursts out into song. And he says, I will proclaim the name of the Lord. That's where we should begin our worship. With the Lord. Who is the Lord? What has the Lord done? What is the Lord like? And there in that song, he goes on and says, ascribe greatness to our God. Our God, he says, is like a rock. That always remains. It doesn't move. Our God is like a father who always cares. He never, ever fails. Our God is like an eagle who is always enough and is strong and will not allow the little ones to fall and die. Can we begin to see what Moses is doing here? Remember, what had been the problem the first time around? When they had stopped at Kadesh, south of the land that God had promised to them. What had been the problem? Can you bring the map up for me, um, please, if you can find it? What had been the problem when they were south of the land? Had it not been that they had looked at the people, the size of the people, the strength of the people, the size of their towns, the walls around them, and the height of the wall? That had been the problem, hadn't they? They'd looked at those things and they'd forgotten all about the Lord. The Lord, they said, has only brought us out here to die. So how is the new generation going to enter the land? How are they going to take possession of it? How are they going to enjoy all that God has promised to them? Because this time they're not going to go in from the south, uh, from Kadesh Barnea, which depending on where you're sitting in church, maybe just to the left of the top part of the cross. They're going to go around the other side and, and through the lands of Edom and Moab and Ammon. And the Lord is going to say to, to Moses, you don't touch those lands. You're not having a feel in all of those lands. I've given those lands to those people. They're your close relatives. Several generations back, but they are. 
The only way that they are going to do that is if they remember the greatness of the Lord. The only way they're going to make that journey, the only way they're going to cross that river, the only way they're going to possess the land that God has promised to them, is if they hold in the forefront of their minds the greatness of the Lord. It's not enough just to say, oh, sovereign Lord, and then just forget. It's about remembering all the time the incredible greatness of the Lord. Now, the Good News Bible says to us uh, that, God, that God has shown him just the beginning of the great and the wonderful things that God is going to do. That gives us the meaning, the idea behind it. The New International Version is a little bit more descriptive. It says, your greatness and your strong hand. And the idea of the hand tells us a number of things about God. It tells us, first of all, that God is strong. Psalm 89 says that the arm of the Lord is endowed with power. His hand is strong. Now to understand what that means, that the hand of the Lord is strong there, read the whole psalm. See what it is that God is strong enough to do. And God is strong enough to keep the covenant that he has made with his people. God is strong enough to control the hosts of heaven. All of the angels, all of the stars. He is sovereign over all of them. His hand is strong enough to control the surging of the seas. You know, when we used to live at the coast in Brixton, you could look at the sea some days and it would be so calm. You get up the next morning and the mist and the spray from the waves as they were crashing in. The hand of the Lord is strong enough to control, to hold back. And so this idea of the hand of the Lord is of his strength. But secondly, it's to speak of his power. You know, when we say to somebody sometimes, this thing is a bit too big for me to carry on my own, or this is difficult to tie up, can you lend me a hand? We don't mean it literally, give me your hand. What we mean is, will you come and help me? Come and use your hand together with mine to help me. And that's the thought here too. That the hand of the Lord is there to help. In Psalm 37, David testifies, Lord, even though I may fall, I will not be cast down forever. Why? Because you uphold, you lift me up with your the hand of the Lord that is strong, the hand of the Lord that helps. The hand of the Lord that is a symbol of protection. My wife Angela has a, an allergy to uh, wasp stings, and if it stings so somewhere that's got part of her arm, uh, then it's going to swell up very, very quickly and can be quite dangerous. So if we sat in the garden with a bowl of fruit in the middle of the summer, and a wasp or a bee comes flying around, then I'm going to put my hand out of the way. Because as far as we know, if it stings my hand, it's not going to be the same. I don't want to get stung. But I don't want Angela to be in danger. So I will use my hand to protect. That's the image here. Ezra in 445 BC tells his story. He has to make a journey from Babylon to go back to Jerusalem. Nehemiah had got ahead some years before. The walls of the city had been rebuilt. It was time to renew the covenant. It was time to teach the word to the people that they might live their lives once again in the city under the instruction of the word of God. And so he says, when we came to the Ahava Canal, we, we stopped to pray together. We fasted, we prayed, we sought the Lord for a safe journey. And then this is where he writes. We set out, dot, 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 <coughs> we arrived. Isn't that great? I know we've missed out part of the sentence, but he says, we set off, dot, 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 we arrived. 
Why? Because the hand of the Lord was upon us and he protected us. Finally, the hand of the Lord is a symbol of God's blessing. Do you know that prayer of Jabez in 1 Chronicles 4? Uh, some of you have got it put out on the cart and uh, use it as a prayer. We're given. His prayer was this. All oh, that you would bless me, let your right hand be with me. Two thoughts are together. The hand, a symbol of God's blessing. And Moses says here, Lord, you've only just begun to show us your greatness and your mighty hand. He had done it in Egypt. He had done it at the Red Sea. He had done it in providing manna and water. He had done it when the Amalekites attacked them. He had done it when they had been bitten by snakes. And oh, just so very, very recently, he had done it when they faced the kings of Sion and Og, who were the nations just above Edom and Ammon and Moab. Because now the people were camped on the east side of the Jordan. But the Lord had helped them. The Lord had been with them. And his hand had protected and had blessed them. And so what Moses does in effect, at the end he simply says, Well, Lord, you are incomparable. As we were singing earlier, there's never been anyone like you. Indescribable. Incomparable. Uncontainable. Amazing. Because you can search heaven and earth and we will not find anyone like the sovereign Lord. There was no one like him in his holiness. There was no one like him in his power. There's no one like him in his compassion. There's no one like him in his love for us. We describe things to people that are new or a person that's new in terms of comparison. Don't we? we say it's a little bit like this or she's a little bit like somebody else. How many of you have ever tasted jackfruit? Okay, so question is how do we explain that to people who have never seen it, touched it or tasted it? We could say, well, it's actually often quite a large fruit. We could say that the outside is, is very thick, a little bit like a watermelon. And the problem is that won't really describe it very well because the skin is not smooth and soft like a watermelon. It's actually quite rough and crinkly on the outside. A little bit more like a pineapple, possibly, but even that doesn't really describe it, does it? So it's very difficult to, to describe what it's like, but then we try and describe what it's like inside. And uh, maybe I might say, should we try and cut it in half? And then as the two halves open up, it's like the selection box of a dairy milk. I mean, it's not chocolate, but it's fruit. But what I mean is, each piece of fruit has its own little place. Yeah? So if we move on to the next picture, you'll see each new piece of fruit has its own place. So you have to take it out. Now, how do you describe that piece? It's sort of a yellowy, whitish colour. About the size of a, a large plum, something like that. Although the stone is usually a bit bigger. So we take and remove the stone, and then we're left with the fruit. Now, how do you describe the texture or the taste? It's very difficult. But we try, and uh, very often we are able to explain something of what that fruit is like by using comparisons. But Moses says even when we take the greatest words, even when we say the most amazing things about God, actually we really can't compare God with anything. Because there is no one like God. With our words, we try. We have a go. But in the end, God is simply incomparable. Now, these are words that are going to be so, so important for God's people. Immediately, God, uh, Moses is giving these words to Joshua. In verse 21, Joshua, I commanded you, but listen, you have seen what the Lord has done. 
You know what the Lord is able to do. And that is a sure sign of what the Lord will do. And therefore, as we hear these words this morning about the greatness of God, the hand of God, the God is incomparable. Those words are to do for us what they did for Joshua. To give him confidence, to give him hope, to give him strength for the challenge that he had. The words are to do for us what they were intended to do for the people, which was to set their focus upon the Lord. To magnify his greatness and see every challenge within the context of that. Because Moses' God is our God. The God of Joshua is our God. The God of Israel is our God. See again this morning how great is our God. Incomparable. And therefore to be trusted and served with all our heart.